All right, today I have with me Mr. Matthew Chang. Do you want to go by Matt or Matthew? What do you think? Uh, you can call me Matt. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I'm Jim. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he wanted to talk about some interesting stuff, specifically Japanese guitars to start off with. We're also going to hit on some of the new Inspired by Gibson stuff. And obviously those two, I feel, correlate to each other when it comes to the price and the value. But we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. And then the reality of being a modern musician where you're in the band, but that's not good enough. You have to be your own social network engineer, your own photographer, your own video editor, um, your own promoter. And he's going through it right now, and we'll be happy to give him a plug and all that. So you want to talk about Japanese guitars? I do. What's your favorite Japanese guitar of all time, whether you own it or you don't? Uh, it, it has to be this Greco that is behind me right there let me go and grab it actually because I've, I've done a few different things to it too to kind of make it my super les paul got it cool so this whoops is my 1981 greco eg 800 c it's part of their super real series mm -hmm. and i got this guitar back in 2022 i was originally looking for something from the lawsuit era, whether it was a Bernie or a Greco, Tokai, anything like that. I originally, there was this blue Bernie from, I think, 1990 that I originally was looking at. But when I got it and I plugged it in and I just kind of went, this, this isn't the one. Yeah. So ended up returning that guitar, just kind of went back on the hunt. Then this guy came up uh, from a guy that was selling it in Japan because the Bernie was coming from a guy that was in the... Uh, that was already stateside. And when this guy showed up, it was honestly in pretty rough shape. But when I opened the case and I went, okay, I th this is going to be worth it to clean this up. So I put new tuners on it because I, I still have the waffle backs, but I think those are, are pretty much completely shot at this point. Like you have to barely touch them and they'll turn like a mile. So I put locking tuners on this guy, uh, changed out the volume knobs, gave it a new poker chip gave it a new uh switch toggle too i had to replace the pickups as well they, they're not stock unfortunately but i like the ones that came in it and later down the road i added the string butler ah <laughs> which i have mixed feelings about because i tried that on my standard and i feel like it actually made the tuning stability worse because i think the nut on that was actually just cut properly yeah. but on this guy it, i think it actually works and I have the TP6 style tailpiece because I'm not spending $150 on a Gibson one. No, no. And I, I like this a lot because the way that I had the tailpiece before, too, the strings were kind of touching the back of the bridge. So this kind of just gave it a little bit more clearance to pass over the top. Yep. But other than that, yeah, this is this is probably my favorite of my made in Japan guitars right now. I love those guitars. The Grecos are always really underrated. Uh, there was just an EG900 for under a thousand bucks. And if I wasn't in moving all around and doing all sorts of crazy stuff, um, I think I would have picked it up. But I've always really liked the necks on those. I think that the neck is one of the strongest suits of it. They they, they tend to be on the, the heavier side, but good way for a Les Paul. Um, the, the neck really... Uh, on the older EGs, uh, late 70s, early 80s. I love those guitars. And those are one of the few brands that haven't gone crazy as far as the price go. Like if you look at Orville by Gibson now, not well, only- They're here, collectible, yeah. <laughs> not only have they gone nuts here in America with the resale, which is its own separate discussion here, but even in Japan, the prices have doubled. And it's turned me off. That's why I haven't had one on, on YouTube at all in I think a year and a half because it's just it's crazy pills because then you're paying the import and you're paying the the shipping and at that point uh you're looking at almost two thousand dollars for Orville by Gibson and that's a lot of money. You gotta really you gotta know you're gonna love it at that point because maybe yeah. break even if you sell it and it's unfortunate. But the good news is we still have brands like that and we still have some people aren't as warm to Tokai yet, but have, have you ever had any experiences with those or just 
read about it. I have it, no, but I mean, from everything I've seen online, the people that own those guitars really love them. So yeah. that it, to me, it's it's surprising why more people don't try to recommend that as an alternative. I, I'm surprised that more people don't recommend FGN too, because I had one of those guitars as well. It was like a standard style, but it was a slightly thinner body. Yeah. Uh, and I and I love that guitar. That thing was sweet. I think the reason is because it's a similar reason to why the ESP eclipses aren't bigger because it's, it's got a modern thing to it. And it's funny because the logo makes such a big difference to some people. It's not that it just doesn't say Gibson on it. It's the actual font of the Fuji jet, the FGN on the top of the headstock that some people are like, that looks a little too much for me. And it's too much of like a metal or a shredder axe. I'm like, no, I'm like, you got to play the thing. I'm like, you got to give it a chance for what it is. But ESP, had a similar thing, whereas the logo wasn't the issue with that. It's the fact that the horns on those were very sharp and pointy. Right. And traditional players of Les Pauls, they don't want anything to do with that. And it's unfortunate because bo both of those, as you said, the Fuji Gen are great and the ESPs, th those eclipses, those are fantastic. I remember I used to get those for like a thousand bucks. And now they're the, the, the E2s, which is what they're now called, that line. They're like two grand. It's it's insane. Even LTDs are like in the same price point as the new inspired by Gibson stuff. So and th those are getting mm. expensive too. <laughs> yeah, those those the EC one thousands were four or five hundred dollars all day used at guitar centers all across the country forever. And then all of a sudden one day that changed. And it is what it is. One thing I do like about those new ones, the LTDs, anything one thousand series and up comes with the stainless steel frets on it. And they do put in, you know, modern pickups and quality hardware from Tone Pro. So I, I, I'm with you on the fact that it, the pricing is getting a little nuts. Um, but at least some brands like ESP are, are giving you a little bit more to go along with that price tag. Yeah. So it, you kind of mentioned it earlier that I thought it's an interesting point because about the brand name and the name on the headstock does mean something for some people because yeah. I'm I'm sure the pictures I've shared in Discord you figured out that I'm very much a Les Paul guy. Yeah. And the other the other guitarist in my band, he's if I had to describe what the kind of dynamic we would bring, it would be like if you put together a discount Steve Vai and a discount slash <laughs> in the same band. So I'm very much the rock focused guy. He's the very like modern like shredder kind of guy so all the stuff he has is like ibanez music man esp that kind of stuff and he he was yeah. telling me he wanted to get a les paul which i was surprised by because i really didn't think he would get on with it okay and i pretty much recommended it to him every brand but gibson <laughs> <laughs> but he ended up getting a gibson he got a 60 standard which when i played it was actually a, a, he got lucky he got a really good guitar considering he didn't have any experience with the brand beforehand but even when i was telling him like oh you know that you can get a you can get a very comparable guitar for a lot less money than what a new standard goes for at like three grand and but at that point he said yeah but if i get a less paul i kind of wanted to say gibson on the headstock and i was like it, it doesn't make sense but at the same time like you do kind of get it that it for some people that that does mean something it's a funny thought because there's a few companies in Japan that are really high end, like like Bizen, uh, G7, that make incredible, and Cruise Maniac Sound, that make extremely expensive Les Pauls that are on paper. And I, I played some of those brands. I haven't played a, a Bizen, and I haven't played um, one of the high end G7s, the Les Pauls. But you know that the craftsmanship is going to be awesome. You know that everything's going to be top tier on it. But when I was thinking and I was looking at that kind of range of price for my 40th birthday, I went back to the R9. And it's funny because I'm with you on the Japanese stuff, obviously. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge Japanese guitar fan. But once you get to a certain price, I still have this thing. I'm like, that's that's a lot. That's a lot of money. For, for something that I'm not sure if it'll hold value. And I'm not even thinking in terms of myself. I'm thinking in terms of just like, oh, I'll give it to my kid. And then one day, you know, she'll have something 
when I'm gone and she can, she can either play it or sell it or what have you with that. And it's a lot easier to get rid of something with a Gibson cash in than it's with a, with a cruise with the G seven or a Bison. However, with, with, when you're talking about the majority of the ones, a Les Paul standard is, is $3,000 now roughly, right? I think twenty seven ninety nine for some models. And then the figured ones are twenty nine ninety nine, or the, 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 the different tops. I think I've <laughs> seen like, the super nice top selling zones for like 32 or 3,300. Yeah. The, the, the triple a tops, those ones are uh, so yeah. So 28, 3,032, depending on the grade of the top or what have you, when you're in that price range, I don't care so much. I'll happily take the, the, the Japanese one for a third of the price that I feel is going to be a better guitar. And to me, that's cool, you know? And one thing that's, not really that known with many people that haven't had a lot of experience with the older ones, like your Greco. Um, people assume that Japanese guitars have always had really bad pickups in them. And that is not always the case. Those dry Z's that were made by um, Maxon, yeah. those are some of the best pickups. They'll sell for $2,000 a set, the original ones. They're crazy good. And looking back on it, I wish that I bought one of those um tokai les paul reborns uh that had one of those sets in it i, I could have got it for such a good deal and i was like i'm not a les paul guy and it's a little too heavy i bought a jaguar instead but ah yeah, man it's that that was such a special time for, for japan and those guitars and you're really lucky you have a really good one yeah i because i when i got the orville i think i paid like 1600 all said and done after yeah. like shipping and all the import fees and it came in and when i sold it i did make a couple hundred bucks off of it luckily that's the crazy uh, part and but when i got this when i got this greco i think i paid 1100 for it all the thing like after all said and done and i'm on you know i i love the guitar but i'm still like when i see the what the prices are looking like these days i'm still back and forth on whether that was a reasonable price to pay for an EG 800. <laughs> you have to ask yourself, are you getting your money's worth out of it? Not, oh, with, not what the tall. market says. Well then yes, th th that's stupid then. Don't, don't, don't overthink it. And that's a trap guitar players get into, you know, you'll be totally happy with the guitar. I'm very guilty of this, by the way, you'll be totally happy with the guitar, but you'll be like, uh, for whatever financial market reason, you know, uh, I should have gotten this one or I should have done this or I'll sell it and I'll get this one instead. That's a better value. At the end of the day, it's sure. all time we're wasting when we already have something that works for us, you know? Hmm. But what, what I thought was really cool about this guy too, and I had to do a bit of digging for it was I, I call this my discount slash guitar because it does yeah. have like that kind of finish. I get it. But uh, I was wondering, because I was looking at pick, I tried to go on Google and just look up you know, Greco EG 800 C and I wouldn't find anything that had like this configuration where it was this tile of burst. And you also had the legit, uh, Gibson style headstock diamond. I think all of them came with like Greco's own version of that symbol. Yep. So I went out to a forum and just asked, Hey, does anyone know anything about this? And someone said that most likely what happened was it was a dealer exclusive finish and they were using some of the older necks that still had that headstock diamond on it. So I was like, okay, pretty cool to have that backstory to it. So yeah, it might've been Yamato music. I think so. I think that might, someone might've mentioned that when, in the, um, in the threads that I was looking at. That's really cool. Yeah. And it's just, it's little details like that. And you find appreciation uh, for the little things. And that reminds me of, I, I, I had one JV in that somebody wanted me to get they didn't trust the process and they knew that i knew about the japanese guitars so i ordered it and i got it and it was one of the ones and when that series first launched it from fender japan instead of a serial number on some of the stratocasters you would have the original owner's name on the back plate so that's really cool yeah so we had i'm not going to say the guy i'll never forget the guy's name because i remember reading it and being like oh man like this is this is wild it's like this is one of the custom order jvs and just thinking like, how cool is that, that a company was willing to do that? And that adds a little bit to the story. I mean, for that person, if they were to keep it for the rest of their lives, but I suppose for when they get resold and all of that, 
that's probably not ideal. You probably want the JV and the serial number right there too with it. Right. <laughs> but he still loves it and he was happy. Um, and he thought that was also pretty cool. Just makes you wonder with these older guitars too. Like it, it, I kind of wish that they could talk and just say the stories that oh, God. they have too. Cause I, like I said, the guitar was in pretty rough shape at, after I got it and it's been in Japan for decades at this point. So I want to know whoever was ripping on this thing earlier in the, in all those Japanese clubs playing rock and roll. Well, that's the good news. Your guitar was actually played like really played more often than not with Japanese instruments, no matter what era that I get them in, they're all in such good shape. It almost makes me sad, but I know that they just take care of their stuff. Even if like guitars that were gigged a decent amount, like, there's an extra level of care that we don't seem to have here <laughs> that it's just, it's something special when you can find guitars from the seventies to this day that are in excellent condition. It's, it's wild. And you don't, you don't often find that with American guitars, like six refinishes on them, four refrets and all this other stuff. Meanwhile, the Japanese ones like, Oh, it's everything's all original. I mean, there's still some life in the frets and yeah, the paint's all still there. It's, it, it it's strange to me to this day but different culture i guess yeah one of my friends that actually he's the bassist in my band he plays guitar too that was looking to get i think an edwards like a edwards their lpc style wine red and p90s which i thought as a super cool guitar that is but he, he basically is consulting me as the japanese guitar guy <laughs> and i was like by basically telling him was like talk to the seller Ask him how the frets are. Try to get pictures if you can. <laughs> that whole process of guiding someone through. Oh, it's it's fun. I get emails every few days about somebody who wants to buy something, and they're like, "Can you help?" And I'm like, "Yeah, uh, it's it, it's weird though, you know." But I, I get it. I get it. It's a different circumstance with me because I'm a schmuck on the internet that provides his email address on top of all the videos. So. <laughs> Because I'm still not an expert because you you very much helped me in getting the um <clears throat> excuse me, the jazz master that's up on that wall too. I know. What do you think of that thing? I know it's oh, you, I, are you still in the honeymoon period or are you out? I, I love that guitar still. I I, I love that thing to death. <laughs> that's got a little bit of a narrower nut on it, doesn't it? I'm sorry? That has a little bit of a narrower nut, I believe. Compared to other JMs? Yeah. I think... I, I can't speak to that because this is the first one I've owned. Yeah, I think the one on that is either 42 or 41 millimeters. The standard is is 43. Um, the, the the Jaguar I have and the Jaguar, the, actually the Jaguar that was in that series, the, the, the same finish, that was, I think, either 39 or 40. And it felt like a paperclip in my hands, like in a really cool way. It inspires you to play a little bit different. I, I dig those guitars. That's not very heavy, is it? It's not. It's very light. Yeah. And I mean, I when I play the guitar, because we're a hard rock band, so I can't I had to mess with the amp settings when I got it. Yeah. So I had to turn the treble like all the way down to two. Otherwise, it would have just been like ice pick. But man, it when I add that distortion to it, it, it sounds mean. It sounds really mean. And I and I love it. That's sweet, man. That's sweet. Do you guys mostly play originals or are you playing cover straight up? We, we're mostly focusing on originals. We're only using covers as a way to just kind of pad out the set yeah. as, as we're working on new songs. I I get it. <laughs> we've all been here. We've all been, uh, done that. Uh, what's the name of your band? Brother? They're called Strike. Strike. Do you have any stuff on the internet? I saw you've been playing some venues that I have wandered in and out of in my younger days. <laughs> yeah, so... We're on. We're pretty much on everything. We actually just released uh our first single on all the streaming stuff. So, What's it uh, our song is called "Dangerous Game." Got it. All right. Well, I'm gonna leave a link to all that, and I'll, yeah, I'll be sure to send that stuff to you. <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome. That's 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 the stuff I like to hear. That's the stuff I prefer to talk about at this point uh, of 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 having done this for so long, and even today. Um, just real quick, like I saw somebody who's a genius with guitar pedals. Like he really is. His name is Cyber Attack. Uh, Ivan's his actual name, but for whatever reason, I went to his channel and I saw like he had a he has a full record that he did by himself, and it's got like no views on it, 
and I don't, uh, it made me sad. So it's just like, I'm going to listen to it. And I was like, this is great. So I, I shared it in the community thing. And I'm like, th th this is what people should be paying attention to. Like, it's great. All the, all the information on YouTube is, is wonderful. It really is. And it's nice having resources. And there's things that I, I have no idea about that without YouTube, I probably would know even less than, than possible. But at the end of the day, especially when it comes to music, um, I, I love following people and, and helping people to get their stuff out there so it can be heard, especially when it's, you know, it's new and it's fresh and you're saying the stuff was just released. So that's, that's fantastic. And I'm sure that it's something I'm going to be into because I, I like heavier music, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Especially to let, you know, we're basically at the stage of a local rock band. And so when we convince people to come out to our shows, it it is it is gratifying to get that reaction to of when you ask a friend to go when you're that guy and you say to a friend oh come check out my band and then after you do your thing and you rock out and you're good they go okay i was expecting to like come out and you know just be a support but like you guys are really good so that that's always that's always very satisfying to get that's that's always the scary part because you don't know and that's part of the thing that sucks about when you talk to your friends about your own music, because sometimes they'll say that, but you don't know because they're your friend mm. and it, not everyone will be blunt with you or honest with you or just be like, not even mean, just like, be like, why don't you like, I have a critique. That's something that should be taken note of. You know what I mean? Whether it's sure. performance based or just music, if it's an actual musician, but you know, it, it's nice to have a support system behind you regardless. And that's awesome that you're finding it. And right now you're playing in LA. Do you guys have any plans of going out of that hellhole? Maybe going down to San Diego or maybe heading up north? You know, it, it's something that's kind of been talked about here and there. I mean, we'll play any show basically, but uh, the last show we played at was at uh, a place called Molly Malone's, like an Irish pub that's in mm -hmm. LA. Yeah. But if we, if we can get, you know, interest in someone that wants us to come out to like, orange county or san diego we we would love to because that that's just we we want to play our music in front of more random people at this point i think i could help you out with that we'll talk okay. about that. we'll talk about that on a different day i still know a few people that are in charge of some of the venues some of the ones that didn't have to close down unfortunately there are still some good ones out there and funny enough there's one place where i know you based on the style of music that you would have a lot of fun and nobody would ever expect it. Um, have you ever been to OB? I don't think so. No. Okay. OB is, is ocean beach and it's, it's right when, where the eight ends, you ride the eight all the way to the end. It meets the five, the five goes up the eight ends and you're at the ocean. OB is right there a little bit South and it's a super hippie kind of thing. It's like, yeah, there's lots of craft beer places. There's a pizza port. There's a whole little touristy strip. But there's a, a bar called Winston's that has a really cool venue at it. And they show out for, for heavy music. It, it, it's actually pretty cool. They'll, they'll do the reggae and all that stuff too. But but heavier bands have played there. And it's, it, it's, a, it's an awesome venue to play at. I'll, so, I'll have to look into it. Yeah, well, even if you just go down and visit, it's, it, it's a really, really cool place to, uh, to spend a day. Uh, I, I like Ocean Beach a lot, but uh, regardless of, of my my nostalgia here, and I wanted to just you wanted to also talk about this and this transitions really well. Being your own marketing person, all the other things that go along with being in the band and trying to get your music out to other people. What have been strategies that you and other bandmates have made? Are you working in you know collaboration with each other? with certain things trying to get things out there as far as like a band uh as one voice or is it a lot of individual kind of like i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that you'll be in charge of this aspect or whatever and try and see if you can hit all the possible areas of interest that you can it's more on the individual side uh because i'm not a savant when it comes to social media stuff at all uh okay. our drummer is the one that's good at that but we also have had those times where He'll post something to a story that 
makes us kind of raise an eyebrow and go, why are you posting this? This has nothing to do with anything. But by and large, he's he's the best one at that. And he's he's pretty good at it most of the time. But we all kind of have our own things to do because uh, since everything is so DIY, when we record, we're our own we're our own producers, basically, because we have a recording uh, like a lockout space that we go to to record stuff. And my other guitarist is actually taking audio production lessons from a guy. And that's who I would say is our producer yeah. for lack of a better word. But other than that, like he's in Ableton, he's, you know, getting guitars recorded and doing the stuff himself. We pretty much only go uh, to that space to record drums because the guy he's taking lessons from used to be in like a national touring band and is a drummer. So he's very good at recording drums. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to other stuff, though, I'm I'm kind of on the graphic design and content creation side because I used to run a YouTube channel, very, very small, like less than like 400 subscribers, but it was something I enjoyed doing. So I had experience with that uh, just as far as like how to edit videos, how to make them, how to just take a bunch of crap footage and try to make it into something watchable. Yeah. And it, it's I. You know, it is kind of funny that that it's it's not enough to just be good with your instruments anymore. But personally, I, I think the whole process of just handling everything yourself is is pretty satisfying in its own way. So it is. Um, the problem becomes other responsibilities that you have to go along with it, because even just even just running a, a YouTube thing that like that that you were doing, you're not, and, and even one like mine, like still small in the grand scheme of things, you think of people that have, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of subscribers and, and views and all of this stuff, like the amount of time that goes into that. Once you've made that point, you're making enough money where you don't need to go to another job unless you're really bad with money. But on the smaller scale, it's, it's really time. You, you need to invest a lot of time into doing it and constantly have something fresh and constantly be, be people's faces because people don't have attention spans. And the difficult thing is, is finding balance and uh, you have other work that you're doing outside of the band, right? I do. Yeah. I, I work at, uh, at a university and in, in their admissions department. So I do have a, a day job too, that, that kind of helps to fund all this. Yeah. And, and I only say that because, in that specific part of the country, uh, unless unless you had a lot of money saved up and you know all the power to you, I mean it's just that is very expensive um, to be to be trying to get by on that, especially once you're like out of college and all that fun stuff. You know what I mean? But it's you are investing your own time, and you're only going to get out of it what you put into it. And having you know different people with different kind of strengths that they can focus on to help promote the band as a whole. That's a really, really good thing. I, I, I can't help but laugh at the, at the drummer posting stuff that you make that you laugh at because we had the exact same thing happen. Although social media wasn't as like dominant back then as, as it is now. So we kind of got away with it and flew under the radar. But the thought of that happening now, um, depending on what it is, like you could, you could really upset a lot of people really easily, which on one hand is really silly because it is. But on the other hand, from a professional standpoint, you just you kind of want to avoid just even going there at all. Sure. Was, was it was it your guys' drummer? So, yeah, <laughs> always is <laughs> always is. And it's funny because when I was a drummer, um, when I was the main drummer in the, uh, the first band I was in, like we didn't have any of that shit. That was um the late nineties, early two thousands. If I had had Instagram or Twitter or any of this stuff, I would have done the same thing because I didn't care. I, I, I was partying. I, I had a loud mouth. I, I, I just, I was punk rock. At least what I thought was punk rock at the time, really just being a, a jerk off, but <laughs> sorry, pardon my French, but it is what being it is. Being a belligerent little, uh, little oh, yeah. POS. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But the thing is, I, I don't know. I never backed down from anything. I've had my fair share of just repercussions from, from being a, a stupid kid. And yeah, as you grow up, you, you figure it out. But yeah, it's always the drummers. The drummers cause the trouble. The singer doesn't show up until they see fit. 
and the bassists and the rhythm guitarists are the ones that are there just like, all right, we're, 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 we're going to do this. We're going to take this seriously or not. Like, I, I, I got to know. It's funny you mentioned that because it, it, I am the rhythm guitar player in the band that occasionally <laughs> does play lead. And our yeah. bassist is we're the ones that if we're in rehearsal and, you know, there's a bit of banter going on, we're the ones that are like, OK, let, let's get back to it now. It will never change. It will never change. I've been I've been in too many bands across the country with people from all different places. It's very rare that you find exceptions to that. But if you do, I mean, that's that's something special. But yeah, the, the, the drummers are kind of their own wild thing, at least in rock music and in, in some of the surf I was playing and, and, and the, the singers. God bless them. They're, they're they're the heart of everything, but they know it. And sometimes they take advantage of it, but they're not all bad. We, and we need them. Because without them, no women would show up, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> our, our drummer very much encapsulates that rock and roll Tommy Lee kind of <laughs> energy. But I will say our guitarist is like the most anti-lead guitarist that I think I've ever met. He's so not pretentious about anything. And I joke that I'm a rock guitarist, but yeah. he's a real musician. <laughs> yeah. And he's oh. he's so good at it that it's like okay, and he's like, dude, I'm just like I'm so bad at this, and I'm like, dude, if don't say that if you're bad, that I've just absolute Wait. dog turned to this. I get it. That's funny, but, but all the time. Sorry, go. Ahead. Oh, you go, you go. Oh, I was gonna say all the time that when we're writing songs, he's always like, I don't want to be in the spotlight, Matt. You should take a guitar solo here. So he's very much not <laughs> like of the lead guitarist mentality. Don't ever get rid of him. Stay on his good side. Most of the time with that, though, that that that's somebody that really does have the talent, the person that is still unsure of themselves. But what will happen is one day they're going to realize they have it. And then what they do with it after that, that remains to be seen. But it's it's nice to have humility just in general. And if he's that good, that's... That that's only going to push him to get better, which should scare you, and that should make you want to practice even more. Because it if does. he still doesn't have the confidence, he's still like, uh, you know, I'm not good enough or I'm not very good. That means that deep down, he he's ready to grind even harder, and that's a good thing overall. But you're gonna have to raise your game up a little bit too. Yeah, it very much like since joining the band, I think I've gotten a lot better at guitar in general. But I there's still a lot of stuff that I, I that I want to work on. What's been your worst gig? Oh, man. <laughs> Tell me all about it. Okay, so there's two I can think of off the top of my head. Because uh, we originally formed this band back, back in, gosh, 2020. Okay. It was me, our other guitarist, who is still in the band, and then our drummer. That was like the original trio. And originally, we just kind of wanted to get together and just play covers. Because, yeah. you know, it, it's fun to pretend you're whatever band you're covering and just you know give people a good time but uh so it took us a bit to find our lineup for that time but we eventually did and we played a gig out in pasadena at a place called old town pub where i think it was the sunday after thanksgiving <laughs> and it was at 11 p.m so i'm sure you can imagine we had a great oh. turnout that night yeah. add insult to injury we were headlining and so we saw the bill and we saw this band i think they were called fever dog that was playing on right before us so we you know we're you know stalking their socials and everything i'm talking to my other guitar player and he's like dude these guys are really good and i went to their stuff and i was like shit they are so we show up to the gig again there's no one in there there's like maybe one rando and the bartender and they the play and they were incredible. And I remember their their like their front man who played like that does the James Hetfield thing. He plays rhythm guitar and he sings. At one point he takes a guitar solo. He goes off this tiny ass stage and just kneels down on the ground while he's playing. And at not one point did I look at that, look at the lack of people in this room and think, oh my God, this is cringy. I just looked at that and went, oh my God, these guys are incredible. That's the real deal. And then after that, I was like, do we have to play Detroit Rock City after this? Are you kidding? 
<laughs> how did they get booked as the, the, ahead of you? How, how, I have no how idea. are they the headliner? I have no idea. They definitely should have been the headliners that night. Oh man. So, so, so you go on stage and you have to follow that. So what made it so horrible outside of the fact that you felt like your self-esteem had just been smashed. You just watched the band kill it and they did it to nobody and still acted like they were in, at the Thunderdome. Yeah. So <laughs> unfortunately, uh, they couldn't be the triple threat where they were also humble too. Cause at one point oh. while we were playing, they there's like an outdoor patio area to this venue. They went outside and there's a door that the bartenders leave open for like, I think a fire safety reason or something. They closed it while we were up there playing and the bartender had to open it up twice. And so after that, just looking out and seeing our, the, our drummer's parents and then like our other star's girlfriend and just compounded that, that we just got destroyed. I was like, I just want to get this done, man. And just go. Home. That sucks. It, it was rough. I mean, that, that was the night though, that, when me and our other guitarists were walking back to the car, we kind of just looked at each other and went, I don't think we could do covers anymore. Yeah. So you found positive out of it, at least. We did. We did. <laughs> and you learned a really valuable lesson. Um, one of the best performances I've ever seen was by Butch Walker and the Marvelous Three. And we went to the venue I had never seen them live. The guitarist in the band that I was in was just like, you got to see this guy. He's a, he's a genius songwriter. He, he is. Um, they went out to nobody in this big hall that we were in called Saratoga Winters in New York. And they didn't, you would have thought the same thing, that they were in front of a packed Madison Square Garden. They left nothing, nothing out there. They just balls to the wall. It was incredible. And I remember thinking to myself at one point, looking around, because I'm like, we played this place, and we kind of went in like, oh, there's not as many people here on different nights. Like, oh, whatever. It's just whatever. We just go through the motions. And that was one of the most valuable things I've ever seen, was seeing somebody uh, that, that's that's what a pro does. They, they go in, and they don't care if it's one person or 10,000 people. They give the same exact passion and energy into the performance. And it's difficult to do that at times, but you can't mail it in. You can't mail it in. Yeah, that because again, we had a we had another gig that was kind of similar where it was only just friends and family. And we had to watch that one wasn't as bad, but we had to watch the previous band after us while they were leaving. All their people started walking out the door and we were just left with an empty room with only five people. So that that was definitely hard, but at the same time, you know the people that did show up, they came out to see you. So you need to turn in a good performance. Gotcha. Yeah. That, that, that's not that's that's deflating. That's very. Yeah. Deflating. But eh, it kind of comes with the territory. What are you gigging with these days? I know you said the Jazz Master, and I'm assuming one of the less Pauls. But what are you using as far as the amps and the pedals? So. The, the the amp I use is a Marshall DSL 100. Oh yeah, you very know. very no nonsense amp. Gets me all the rock and roll tones I need. Can get heavier if I need it. Can get clean if I need it. Love that amp. Yep. Uh, as far as pedals though, it's a I have quite a few on my board, but it's a pretty simple setup that I use most of the time. We have songs that are in D standard, E flat, and now E standard. So I have a drop pedal as like the first thing on my board. Yeah. So most of my guitars are in E standard. And then I just use the drop pedal, go back and forth between tunings. So I don't need to retune my guitar all the time or switch between guitars uh, during the set. Very useful pedal. People online have their debates on what it does to the tone. I don't, I don't care. It, it does what I need it to do. And it doesn't affect it in any appreciable way to me. Yep. Um, I, I pretty much leave my my Marshall on the crunch setting at like the ACDC levels where it is like distorted, but not too much. If I need to just give it a little bit of a boost, I have a Boss SD-1 to just give it a little bit of a push. I actually use that, the, the Tumnus that I got recently in Christmas as my main distortion pedal. Yep. When I put that in front of the crunch channel, it sounds incredible. You don't need much with a Marshall. No. 
<laughs> because what, like the perfect setting is crunch because if you leave it at crunch, you throw a tumness or an EP boost or whatever for when you need to get really hairy. And if you need to clean up, you're not so distorted from the amp that you can roll off the volume a little bit on the guitar and you'll be good to go. Because I, I don't I don't use the amps OD channels at all. I don't use the clean channel either. I pretty much just leave it on crunch. That's easy. Yeah. It's easy. And going back, you have the Digitech one, the detuner? Yeah, the Digitech drop. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that say all sorts of crap online. And the way I look at it is first of all, the only thing I will say that is noticeably different to me is just the feel of the instrument compared to actually having it drop down because it's string tension. That's yeah. nobody in the audience cares, knows, acknowledges, unless they're somebody that's on, you know, a forum or on the internet looking at all this guitar stuff. They don't care. It's going to sound just fine to them and it's going to serve the purpose. And so it makes me happy to know that you're just like, whatever, it works for me because that's the right perspective, at least in my opinion, that you should take towards gear. Does it serve the purpose that I need it to do? If it does, that's it. That's the end of the conversation. We're happy. The audience is happy. And that's it. That's all that matters. It just makes sense logistically as well. Yeah. And that's easy. It's way easier to have all the guitars tuned up in one thing. And that's, I, I made that mistake and it sucked. I, I go to gigs. I bring one guitar in standard and one half step down. And the sets are built out where I'm not switching guitars between the sets. How, or I'm not switching guitars during the sweats. I, I switch between the sets. So all the songs that are in standard and the first one, yada, yada, yada. If I have a problem or if I break a string, which is very rare, but it has happened in the middle of either of those sets, I've kind of left myself up a creek, so to speak. And then it's like, you know, eventually I figured out, you know, really, you should know how to play this on, on both of them in the same key, um, unless it's tuned to half step down and then um, it's open chords, in which case you're you're in deep trouble because you're just not going to capture the same vibe. You have to play an octave higher up on the neck. But yeah, having just one tuning and a pedal to do it, no harm, no foul in my book, my friend. It Because like I said, we're switching between three different tunings. It, it just makes things easier. We try to group songs together when we can. Yeah. But we've definitely had times where we structure the set list in a way where it works better to have it where it maybe it doesn't group together as nicely but luckily our singer is pretty good at gabbing so most of the time he'll know when to start doing his thing and then we'll just go down because we we all use uh i is it pitch shifter polyphonic whatever mm. the correct terminology is uh because my basis he uses he had the same drop pedal on his uh board too works just fine for bass as well and what then and then our other guitarist, like I said, he's the modern guy. So he has a quad cortex. He has a helix. And those have like those own pitch shifting functions on it too. So we all very much don't mind using the tech that's available to us. You shouldn't. And especially for him, his back is very happy about the quad cortex. I can be assured of that. Or the helix, whichever one he's using on that given night. Yeah, he 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 keeps bugging me about getting a modeler. And I'm like, yes, I know I should, but I, I like my four by 12 and I like my, my, my Marshall. <laughs> I will give you this advice. So long as you are physically capable, play the damn four by 12, enjoy it while you can have all the fun in the world with that, because there will come a day where you're starting to load in and load out. And you're like, this is just too much. This is not practical and you're not going to do it ever again. So while you're still having this mentality of, no, I like this, this is fine. Ride it out. Don't listen to what anybody says because there's nothing like that. That is an awesome feeling on stage, having that air push you. And with the drummer's volume behind you, you don't got to worry about miking anything up. You don't have to worry about getting lost in the mix. You know that you definitely don't have to worry about that. And it's just it's a it's a different layer to the experience of performing live when you have that kind of rig behind you. So yeah, I say stay with it. He could play his modeling stuff and he could have fun, but you have your fun too. He's he's probably going to end up watching this when this goes live too. So <laughs> it will be very vindicating to hear someone know. else say that. <laughs> but also that I, I called him the most dangerous one in the band because if he doesn't think he's very good yet and he's actually really good, oh man, you you guys are in deep trouble. 
you better hope he doesn't get a, uh, you know, sniped by some other bigger band and stolen away from you all when, <laughs> when he starts playing. It's L.A., baby. You you, you can't be you can't be too careful. <laughs> well, you know we we have talked about that though, where uh, I've like I've had people hit me up on like band mix or like the other sites that people use to try to find people to play with, and we've both had a fair amount of people reaching out to us. But he's told me that uh, what he loves about being in this band is that with this particular lineup that we have now that. It, it's so easy to work together and to be on the same page as far as like the kind of sound that we want to go for. But at the same time <laughs> that, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is what it is. It's not really earth shattering, but you, you, you don't, you only have to really worry about it if somebody's not happy. And if you guys are friends and everything's cool, that it's, it'd be the last thing to worry about. I was just kind of poking the bear, so to speak, because unfortunately I have seen that happen um, quite a few times in my day, especially in that area of the country. There is just no regard for anything as far as that part of it goes. But if you guys joined together, you started a thing together, the odds of that are much lower than if you had met through some other sort of aggregate group or social media thing or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I've, I've seen that happen to people too, where like, there's a band where one of the people in it is just exceptional and then they end up getting scouted and taken away for some other band that's like up and coming that really wants to do something. Yep. It used to be that the label would, 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 would find them and then they get them on an individual deal on the condition that the whole band has to go. And you know, part of me understands, especially back then, um, when you weren't able to do all the self-promotion that we can do now, um, how some people could be tempted to do that because it's like, all right, that's like your one shot. They're basically saying like, you're the talent. Um, why don't we get you with these people? It's, it's a rough industry. It's a really rough industry, but thankfully it's not as bad now because of, like I said, like you could do your own self-promotion and if you're good enough, like you work hard enough on top of being good enough. Cause it's not just, it's not enough to just be an awesome band unfortunately anymore you have to be everything you have to be awesome at everything but i don't know what would you say your long-term goals are then uh we're hoping that well we have four originals right now that we're hoping to have them all out before maybe the end of summer if we're talking about a realistic schedule of just keeping everyone's finances in mind getting enough tracking sessions the mixing done and we're still writing more songs we want to have uh we want to have an album out before the end of next year and other than that we just want to keep playing because right now i think the goal is playing a place like house of blues or the belasco or one of those bigger small venues that are in la or in oc one of those two but i don't know we're willing to take this as far as we can get it but we're just having we're, we have no delusions about we're going to be the next guns and roses or anything like that we, we we're just having fun doing this that's all that matters but it's good that your goal isn't like unattainable like sometimes it's good to have something that is might seem like a pipe dream but also it's just gonna be like i do just want to have a record i do just want to be able to play a few venues within reason and that's all stuff that y you will be able to accomplish you know and yeah i, I hope it works out for you but before we get going I'm going to give you a minute here because I did mention earlier and you mentioned in the email that you did want to talk about this. It's the gear stuff. Let me know your thoughts about this Epiphone pricing. What do you so, think? <laughs> okay. When it comes to the Firebirds, I think those are ridiculous. Yeah. Which sucks because those are, those are really cool, especially that Firebird 5. That, But at the same time, when I look at, okay, this is $1,700, but where else can you get one of these if you don't? Because Gibson, yeah, they don't make Firebirds like that in their USA production anymore. So you have to go to the custom shop. So it, it's that thing where it feels this sucks, but what other choice do you have? They got you. They've got you. You know who? You know who's a really good alternative to that? What's that? Is cower. 
company called Cower. They make the Banshee. I think I might have seen them pop up on my Instagram, actually. Badass. Super badass. Also, keep your eyes peeled in Japan for the Bernie versions of them. Those ones especially. The Bernie ones, they're really good. They're really good. But the problem becomes the cowers are very expensive. And the Bernies and some of the other Japanese brands, because they've been made by quite a few, they, they don't last long even in Japan. Because they suffer from the same problem. There's nowhere mass producing them. So I feel like Epiphone and Gibson, in, in, this, in the case of the Firebird, it's like abuse of power. Because they know they're the only ones in town that have it. But the one thing I will say is this. You can still get a Firebird from Epiphone. Granted, you're not getting the, the, the Vibrola, which is also known as the thing that makes the guitars go out of tune as soon as you look at it, um, for 600 bucks or 650 bucks, That's still the same kind of core design to it. It's just different finishes, and you're not getting the American pickups. So there are alternatives out there, and that's a $1,000 difference. If I was somebody looking at a Firebird, I would go to, I believe, American Musical or the place that have these still, and check out one of those. And then throw in whatever pickups. You could throw in Lawlers. You could throw in Duncans. You could throw in Fralins. It doesn't matter. And you're still going to come out like way on top. Because they're still using CTS. They're still using Switchcraft. As far as the components go, you're just getting the import pickups. If I remember correctly on those Firebirds. So it is unfortunate. There aren't many brands doing it Um, on the higher end cow banshee. But then again, you're like, Oh, maybe I could just buy a used Gibson custom at that price. And then we're right back where we started today's conversation about, you know, the other brands. And do you really want to spend that much on the other brands and the perception and other people's opinions on that firebird aside? What do you think about, that stuff. And now that you know, and you've had experience with some of these Japanese guitars, is there a scenario where you could see yourself, if you're shopping for another Les Paul, maybe you don't go with a Tokai, a used one from Japan. Maybe you don't go with a Greco or ESP or a Navigator. And you say, you know what? This is easy. I can go to the local guitar center, even in West Hollywood. And and pick up one of these uh, inspired by Gibson Les Paul customs for thirteen hundred dollars that come with the same pickups as the custom shop American models do. Is there a real debate in your own head? Not speaking for anybody else, just you. Is this something that you would consider ha- with your experience and knowing the prices of some of the Japanese stuff? I I would say it is more likely than not. But I I don't I know I mentioned it in uh, one of your streams about that these are very tempting that Black Beauty is very clean looking but I I don't think I'll end up getting one. <laughs> no, the beautiful thing about this is, as more of them get made and the longer that they're released, they will be half price, very soon on the used market because they're not going to hold their value like a Gibson and times are not exactly booming for people spending, especially on used instruments. And I just realized I've been holding a Stratocaster vibrato arm for the last like 10 minutes. I'm just, that I'm that kind of person. It used to be a poker chip, but for whatever reason today, it's a, it's a vibrato arm. So if it looks like I'm, I've just had this off. in my lap the whole time. <laughs> I can't, I can't sit with a guitar in this setup because it would just be smashing against the desk. And Besides, everybody's nobody cares about my stuff anymore. It, it's all been it's all been done to death. It's more interesting to see other people's stuff, and I do love that Greco. And don't don't look down on it. Don't think about it. It works for you. You love it. You're happy. You're good. Just use that. Use the Jazzmaster, and you're you're fine. You cover everything you need. I mean, yeah, basically. <laughs> all right. Anything you want to close off with? Anything you want to promo shoot or potentially leave information wise for people to check you guys out? Yeah, so uh, to the people that have actually sat through this, uh, thanks. There will be that, many. Yeah, <laughs> that that means a lot. Uh, my name is Matt Chang. I am part of the band Strike. That is Strike with a Y. We're on Instagram at Strike Rocks. That's spelled exactly how you think. No underscores, nothing like that. S T R Y K E Rocks. 
and you'll find our link tree on there that takes you to everything all our social media because we're on tiktok too because it's 2024 and you have to be on tiktok i mean unfortunately <laughs> but you'll find all our stuff there our single that's ready to stream we're working on new stuff and we hope that if there's anyone in california you might come by and see us play if we're playing somewhere near you well what's your next gig that's the last thing uh our next gig is at the doll hut in anaheim on april 20th playing 420 in anaheim that's gonna be fun that's it's, it's on it's gonna be a saturday night too so that should yeah, be I a know. fun one <laughs> well i wish you well take some video have some fun you ever want to share anything send it on over to me and i'll be happy to help you guys out give us some promo will do it, it was awesome. But thanks for sending this up, Jim, because I've been watching your videos for a while. So th this was this was awesome to do. No, it's my pleasure. It, it, it's always fun talking to new people and especially people out in California, see even how the grind is like and how things are out there in general. And yeah, it's, it's good to do. So thank you for your time today. And to everybody who's watched, thank you. And that's where we're going to be wrapping up today. I'll see you on the next one. Matt, say you goodbye too. Later, everyone. All right. Take care. Go play your guitars. Bye-bye.